Tonight we are going to continue our book study on the book of Genesis. And tonight we are going to be in chapter number 5. And basically chapter number 5 in literary form, it is basically building on how chapter 4 ended with the attention going uh, to Adam and Adam's descendants tracking the the genealogy of Adam basically to the flood. Now, I want you to think about this. We are going to go past a lot of time, a large space of time. And so we are going to look at a lot of things that we've probably never heard about in church, things that you don't hear taught about, but I can assure you they are very important uh, if we're going to understand and grasp the whole idea or theme of the book of Genesis and, and really the whole Bible. Some of the things that we are going to learn about this week and next week are fundamental, very fundamental uh, for a proper interpretation of the rest of the Bible going forward. And it's going to help set us up to understanding why God chose a specific ethnic group in the, the people of Israel. Uh, so we're going to answer a lot of questions that you may have had subconsciously that you've just never asked or may, maybe you've looked in the Bible and haven't found the answer. So we're going to see that chapter 4, what we went over last time when we were in the book of Genesis was basically Satan's response to the declaration or the curse that was pronounced upon the serpent. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your, her, your seed and her seed. And basically, it was God's way of saying, I'm going to judge you through humanity. A human being is going to bring your destruction, your demise, and your judgment. Okay? Now, Satan's response to that was to use Cain to kill Abel, to kill off the righteous son of Adam and Eve. Because God's plan and God's design was to use human beings from Adam all the way until Christ. And he was very specific in his plan of how he was going to accomplish these things. And so the enemy knew that, so he goes to attacking the seed trying to destroy the righteous seed so that he could hopefully, in his mind, thwart the plan of God and defeat God's plan to destroy himself. Now, what's amazing is chapter 5, and, and even the, the last few verses there, verse 25 and 26 of chapter 4, turns our t attention to Adam and Eve having another son who would be a righteous son, who would take the place of Abel. From, from there, Seth, his, his uh, lineage from Adam to Seth all the way down to Noah, ten generations that bring us to the flood, show us that God preserved a purely human lineage of righteous individuals all the way to the flood. Okay, now that would have been very important to someone under the context of Moses writing this, the, the, the people of Israel. All of these things would have been important because they understood and were familiar with the reality of what we'll read in Genesis chapter 6. And Genesis is kind of a book, and a lot of the Bible is this way. It's, it's a book where you kind of sometimes have to read ahead and then reflect. Like, chapter 5 will make more sense when we read chapter 6, and chapter 10 will make more sense when we read chapter 11. There are a lot of things that make sense when you just read ahead. The book of Revelation is a lot the same. A lot of things will be interpreted if you just keep reading, and then you can insert that back into what you've already read that perhaps you did not understand. And that's exactly what we're going to run into. So um, we're going to see some neat things tonight about the redemptive plan of God. And in chapter 5, this is God's response to what Satan did in trying to kill Abel, the righteous seed. And this is just God showing uh, that you can't best him. 
He's always got a plan. He had a plan. I, I like the way uh, Peter says it in the book of Revelation, says that God had a plan. There was a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The plan of redemption was already decided before he ever created humanity. That's how amazing God is. And he brought that plan to pass. Okay, so let's jump into, let's go ahead and read verse 25 and 26 because it goes together with chapter 5. And then I want you to understand it this way. Uh, what we read from chapter 5 should actually flow through to chapter 6 and verse 8. We're not going to cover any of chapter 6 tonight because we're going to spend at least a week or two in the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 6. Uh, but thematically, as far as the literary layout of the book of Genesis, I want you to view uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 as flowing all the way through to chapter 6 and verse 8, and then 6 and verse 9 is another literary form or layout in the book. Okay, Genesis 4 and verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth, or Shaped. For God said, for, for God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also, there were bo was born a son, and he called his name Enos, or Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So in other words, uh, as a replacement for Abel, as the righteous seed, they give birth to another son. His name is Seth. He's given the name because his name is connected to the idea of what God has done. He has appointed or he has given them another son in place of Abel. All right, now, chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, I know that everybody loves the genealogies in their Bible, right? Yeah, this is the part where we go, uh, I think I'm going to skip this chapter. But as you're going to see tonight, by the time we get done, you're going to see that there is a great deal of information and a lot to be gleaned from reading a genealogy. So bear with me as we read through the begatting and uh, the, the numbering of, their, uh, of the, the years of their life. And at the end, we will see some things that I, I believe are going to be very informative and will help you understand what the purpose of genealogy is in the Bible. Um, this is the book of the generations of Adam, or mankind. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Notice that he's drawing a connection back to how God originally created things. In other words, to say God's plan is still going forth despite what we've just read in chapter number 4. He says in verse 2, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name. Notice how it says it called their name Adam, mankind. Together, man and woman, uh, bring this concept of humanity or mankind. Okay, it's, it says, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. In the days of Adam, after he begotten Seth, were eight hundred years, and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. I want to stop there for just a minute. And as we read through this, you'll see the same formula that is introduced. You will have so-and-so lived X number of years, and he fathered the next person in line in the genealogy. And then, then it will say, that person who fathered lived this long after he fathered and had sons and daughters. And then you'll find that it lists how long their lifespan was. All of that's important because that allows us 
to use simple math to get a definitive outline of the overlapping lifespans, for one thing, and it also establishes a historical outline, chronologically, of events all the way to the flood. For example, we'll see later on when I show you a PowerPoint that based on simple math, we can figure up the exact year of the flood from the creation of Adam. Okay, and we'll look at that. And that, that's why that's in there. So we're going to scroll up and verse number 6. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. And Seth lived after he begot Enosh 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And Enosh lived after he begot Canaan 815 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Notice how the pattern is pretty much the same other than we'll see a few variants as we read along. And there's a reason, I believe, why uh, there is more information given. And Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. And Canaan lived after he begot Mahalalel 840 years, begot sons and daughters. In all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. And Mahalalel lived 60 and 5 years and begot Jared, or Yared. And Mahalalel lived after he begot Jared 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and 5 years and he died. Verse 18. And Jared lived 160 and 2 years and he begot Enoch or Hanoch. And Jared lived after he begot Enoch 800 years and begot sons and daughters and all the days of Jared were 960 and two years and he died and Enoch lived 60 and five years and begot Methuselah or Methuselah and Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And if we stayed true to the pattern, it would say, and he died, right? And then we'd move on to the next person in line in the genealogy. But notice what it says. We're going to scroll back up to the top in verse number 24. It goes on to say this, And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. The same type of terminology that's used when Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, the chariot of fire by the Lord. Okay? Uh, so it say, it's basically saying that God, we would say in modern vernacular, raptured him. What's amazing is Enoch is what generation? The seventh. Imagine that. Where else do we see the number seven a lot? In the book of Revelation. So I think it's very interesting that he happened to be the seventh from Adam. And because he walked with God, and when we, when we look at the example in Hebrews, it said that he had the testimony that he pleased God because he walked with God. Um, then God brought him up to heaven, and he didn't experience death. There are two human beings that never experienced death, Enoch and Elijah. They were just translated uh, into heaven by the Lord. Now, when we get into chapter number 6, we're actually going to diverge and read portions of the book of Enoch. And we won't read a lot of it because it's very lengthy, but we will read portions of it. But I encourage you to read the book because it is a book that is quoted by New Testament authors and it talks about Enoch's life and 
some of the things that he experienced. Um, so I encourage you to read that. We're having a technical difficulty. Check. Can you hear me now? I just turned it off and on. Okay. So, I forgot where I was. Oh, yeah. Read the book of Enoch because it will bring some clarity to a lot of things uh, that you read in the Old and New Testament about his life, what he experienced, and especially about... Uh, divine beings interacting with human beings, how normal that was. And uh, it's just a good read. Okay. Verse 25. And Methuselah lived a hundred eighty and seven years, and he begot Lamech, or Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begot Lamech, 780 and two years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. The longest human being uh, to ever live, or the longest lifespan of a human being to ever live is Methuselah, or at least that we know of. And Lamech lived a hundred eighty and two years and begot a son and called his name Noah, or in Hebrew, Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us. The word comfort there is taken from the same root as his name, thus his name. He shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Verse 30, And Lamech lived after he begot Noah 590 and five years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and begot Shem Ham and Japheth. Okay, it's kind of interesting how it goes to the tenth person, which is Noah, and then just says, okay, he was 500 years old, and then he had basically three sons. Now, all of this genealogy, as I said earlier, was to prove that God had preserved or maintained a pure lineage of human, human beings who were righteous in that they honored God and were devoted to God all the way to the flood, okay? Because we know that only Noah, his wife, and Noah's three sons and their three wives were the only human beings that survived the flood, okay? So what chapter 5 is trying to show us in detail is the progression from Adam to Noah and that a pure race of human beings was preserved. Now, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the fact that divine beings could visit mankind and procreate with them and create an offspring that we refer to as, in our English Bibles, as giants, or in Hebrew, the Nephilim or the Rephaim. Um, we will talk about them in great detail as we move through this book. Um, but let's stick with chapter number 5, and I want to point out some things and show you some things that I think are very interesting. If you'll look at the first slide, I have given you uh, basically the birth. In, in the center column, you have the birth and the date of death from essentially the creation of Adam in the life of these first ten patriarchs. Now, I want you to look at the overlapping uh, of lifespans. For example, Adam was alive when Noah's dad was alive. Are you kidding me? Noah, who was alive and experienced the flood, 
when he was 600 years old, his dad knew the first guy that God created. That's pretty fascinating. You can preserve history very well when you only have a few generations that information has passed. I mean, think about it. Adam would have talked to Noah's dad about walking with God in the Garden of Eden. And so it's easy to see how history could have been preserved so adequately and so definitively because you have not several people involved. I mean, you have Noah's father who heard from the mouth of Adam about creation, naming the animals, being in the garden. I mean, all of these things that we read about in the early pages of Genesis. Now, what's amazing is here we are in Genesis chapter 5 and... By the time we get to the, the end of this genealogy, you have 1,500 years that have passed in human history. I mean, think of it this way. Right now, we're sitting at about 6,000 years that have passed in human history as, as we know it. Okay? 1,500 years of that is contained in five chapters of our Bible. So, maybe if we dig a little bit deeper, we will see some things in the text that would be blurred if we just read through it fast or skip over it because we're bored with the genealogies, because they can't be important, right? Genealogies are very important because they are so connected to the authenticity of the lineage that Christ came from. And that's one thing the Bible preserves all the way from Adam until Jesus. That's why the last genealogies that we find are in the Gospels. Because when Jesus comes on the scene, we don't need genealogies anymore because Christ is that seed. He is the seed who would judge the serpent. He is the seed who would bring judgment upon all those who oppose God. Therefore, we don't need genealogies anymore because we are one in Christ Jesus through faith. It's not about ethnicity anymore. It's not about preserving a, a, a pure lineage of human beings now because Jesus has come. The plan of the enemy, the plan of the serpent failed. He couldn't destroy mankind. He couldn't destroy the seed of the woman. He got really close. He got really close. Eight people got on the ark. There was a point in time where uh, all of the kings of Judah were killed except for one that was hidden. I mean, he got really close through using human beings and procreating with human beings to annihilating the human race. But he didn't accomplish it. So here we are in the 21st century, celebrating the finished work of Christ, talking about all of these things and the accomplishment that Jesus brought. Now, I want to look at the Hebrew names behind these first ten patriarchs. I, I want to see if there's something that we can learn. Okay? The first one is Adam, which means mankind. It's also used as a proper name for the, the male, Adam. But generally, in a lot of places throughout the book of Genesis, Adam means mankind. It's not limited to just the male species of the human race. It includes all of humanity. The second son is Shait, which means appointed. Enosh, which means mortal. Canaan, which means a, a, a dwelling, or it, it can even mean like a nest. Um, Mahalalel means the praised of God. Notice the, the ending on that. Or, or, or the center of it. Halal is the root word in hallelujah, which means praise the Lord, praise Yahweh. Okay? Now let's go to the second set of five. Yered, which means descends. Chanoch, which means dedicating or training. And then you have metushelach, which means his death sins which is pretty fascinating. 
uh, Lemech, which means powerful, and Noah, or Noah, which means rest. Now, if we look at that and put it in a sentence form, the first ten patriarchs' name mean this, and I think this is just God laughing at the futile attempts of the enemy to destroy the righteous seed. Mankind is appointed mortal dwelling. The praised of God comes down dedicating and training. His death sends powerful rest. Wouldn't you know the gospel message pointing to Christ, the Messiah, the seed, is revealed in the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 as a response to the killing of Abel by Cain. It's God saying, my plan is intact, and I'm going to name these people accordingly so that the gospel message is seen as early as Genesis chapter 5 in what he was accomplished. Because what we just read describes what happened. Man was appointed a mortal dwelling, the fall. The day you eat, dying you will begin to die. But the praised of God comes down dedicating and training. I wonder who that would be. Jesus. What did He come? He came and He made disciples. And His death sends powerful rest. When you go to the upper room, Jesus told His disciples that I'm going to go away, but my peace I leave with you. Not the peace of this world, but my peace I give unto you. And His death would give rest to us. Why? Because we have the hope of eternal life in Christ. And we have our sins atoned for. The punishment has been paid. And we have been forgiven. Okay? Now, I want to go back. And the third one is Methuselah. Methuselah which means his death sins. Okay? And I think this is just super fascinating. Let's go back to the first one. And I want you to notice Methuselah died in 1656, which happens to be the year of the flood. When you study extra-biblical writings they tell us that Methuselah died and seven days later, the flood came. His name means his death sins. So in other words, think about it, guys. Wrap your mind around this because this shows the mercy and the long-suffering of God. A guy who is named at his birth in, in the year 1687, his name means... Basically, his death sins. And and I believe it's referring to the judgment of the flood. Okay? His name means that. He also happens to be the guy who lived longer than any other human being. And so the flood couldn't come until he died, and he outlived any other human being, which is a testimony to the long-suffering of God. In other words, it's like God was letting his life be prolonged and putting off the flood until he died because his, his name meant his death sins. So when he died seven days later, what happened? The flood came. And only Noah, Noah's wife, his three sons, their three wives got on the ark, eight people, and everybody else perished in the flood. That is a testimony to the long-suffering of God. Peter writes about a, a, a parallel there between... Noah's day and the days that precede the coming of the Lord. And he basically says, you may tell you why the Lord has delayed His coming? I mean, he's writing 2,000 years ago. You know why the Lord's delayed His coming? Because He's not willing that any should perish. It's not His will that anyone perishes. But there's going to come a day where just like Methuselah finally had to die, And when he dies, the flood's going to come. There's coming a day that despite the long-suffering of God, things are going to change. The trumpet's really going to sound. And what we've heard all of our life, and generations from the early church till now have heard their whole lives, Jesus is really going to come back. And when he does, he's going to bring judgment upon the unrighteous and preservation for the saints, just like the flood.
Because as Jesus himself said while he was here on this earth, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. When he returns, the righteous will be exalted and all those who are not in right standing with God will be destroyed. Okay? It's going to be a catastrophic day, but also a day of vindication for God's saints. Okay? So, the genealogies are more exciting than they appear on the surface. Would you agree? And when we look at this, we can see the influence of Adam for nine generations. Nine generations. That being passed to Noah, Noah being preserved through the flood by the ark, Noah would have preserved and passed on that information to his three sons, and then what we're actually going to see when we go forward and look at some more genealogies, I'm just going to throw this out there as bait to hopefully incite you to read ahead. Did you know that Noah was alive when Abraham was alive? Did you know that Shem outlived Abraham? Some, just some things to think about and to read ahead. And it's just amazing how something as simple as Math can lay out a historical uh, chronology of the early history of humanity leading up to the flood, which again, we know took place in the year 1656, according to the math that we see. Now, one thing that I do want to point out, um, because you could run across literature or something that would talk about the, the lifespan of these patriarchs here in Genesis chapter 5. There is a discrepancy between what the Hebrew Masoretic text says in the age of these patriarchs compared to the Samaritan Pentateuch and compared to the Septuagint. Huge discrepancies. Um, I won't get into that, but like I've said before, there is no perfect... Uh, preservation of any ancient text, but I believe, I, I really believe that the Masoretic text is accurate because there are extra biblical writings that align with the Masoretic text versus the Septuagint, the Greek translation of this, or the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, which is vastly different. Um, like I said, I won't go into the details of that because I'm sure textual criticism would bore you to death but I want to make you aware of that. That way, if you're reading something on the internet and you have a naysayer that's going to say, well, there's discrepancies. The Septuagint says that the flood happened in uh, such and such year and, and, you know, these different editions say this, that you're not thrown off and, and don't feel like we have a good base here that we can go by. Okay. We're going to stop right there because if we go into chapter 6, um, we're going to run into a lot of questions, uh, but also a lot of answers. Uh, so I'm going to take this time to stop. And if you have any que questions about what we've read thus far, fire away. Well, it only lists one son per, per generation. Right. So obviously one son can only come from one wife, but it doesn't say whether or not they had multiple wives. It doesn't name any of the wives. Um, you have to understand their culture was different than our culture. In their culture, um, men went to war 
and men were the only ones numbered. Matter of fact, they numbered, well, not, not as old as this, but develop, developing into the time of the children of Israel, they would count the men that were of age to go to war. That's how they kept a number. Um, so their culture was different, but it's ambiguous on the reason why there is no women named because in some genealogies there are especially when you get into the gospels and you look at the genealogies there there are certain women that are included i believe there's a theological purpose in those that could be explained uh, because it's very strategic on the women that are handpicked and selected to be included um, but as far as why they're not here uh, it's not clear There's really no for sure way to know. I would, I mean, if you was to ask my opinion, I would say basically things look different. The, the, the shape of the continents being pushed together. Uh, we ain't got to that, but we'll see how the Tower of Babel actually caused that division and that split and earthquake that took place with the Tower of Babel. Um, so, the, so the geography would have looked different because things move. The so-called Pangea actually occurred at a different time than what's proposed by scientists. Um, and unless the Bible is not true, I'm going to go with the Bible. <laughs> but uh, I would say into what we call Babylon area, at least that far, Any others? Yeah, was there in James, I know that they like really took thought in what they named their kids back then. So like with that one being named Canaan, you would think that he would have been named after Cain. So you, what do you think that that would have been like frowned upon since Cain killed Abel, or was that not even like in their thinking? It's a different word than Cain in Hebrew is Cain, and this name here is Canaan, and so they're not the same. There's, and that's the trick about sometimes in English, words can sound almost identical, and that's why you have different theories that are pro, uh, proposed on things that phonetically sound similar. Like today, a lot of modern-day prophecy, prophecy scholars will say that... Um, you know, Gog and Magog. Uh, Magog sounds similar to places in Russia, so it has to be referring to Russia. Anyway, I'm not going to chase that rabbit, but phonetically, when you have a difference in languages and translations, a lot of times it blurs the differences that are there if you know the language. Um, so in this case, they're not similar. Um, there are descendants of Cain and descendants of Seth going through Seth that have the same names, though. Um, but that doesn't... It doesn't tell us how, how long... It, it's not as definitive in Cain's genealogy as far as the lifespans as what we have here. So we don't know, you know, could they have had... Could Seth... Could he have had the one who was named the same as Cain's descendants beforehand, or, you know, there's no way to know for sure. But they definitely named specifically. They didn't just pick a name. Oh, no other kid has this name. Let's just make up a name and name them that. No, they named their kids stuff that a lot of times had a propheticness attached to it, like Noah. He shall comfort us. He shall comfort us. Um, taken from the root word nuach, which means to bring rest or comfort. Um, and, and we see that a lot. We'll see that more developed. That's the same way I'm going to get from them. I feel like it kind of bleeds over into the salvation topic. But um, actually, first of all, I want to know, what is Cain and Abel? What do those names mean? If we go back, here, here's a good example of 
I'm going to show you another Babel software. And if some of you guys don't want to take the plunge and buy Logos, I want to encourage you to get Olive Tree because it is a lot cheaper. And for example, if you look at this side of the screen right here, if you get, I have a King James with Strong's, it's tagged with Strong's, so basically you can click on a word, it will pull up the definition, it'll give you the base definition, it'll give you the root that that word was derived from, and, and this will be a perfect opportunity to show you. So you click on that, it shows you the name is Kine, it tells you that it's the Strong's H714, can y'all see that or is it too small? And when you read it, it says the same as 7013. So you click on that, and you can see that it's connected to Spear. His name is connected to, to Strike Fast. And a lot of these words, there's a debate, because there are some scholars who say, oh, it's a... Ugaritic name or a Phoenician name or Akkadian or some of these ancient Near East uh, languages because we, we have to understand they shared languages, okay? At least until the Tower of Babel it says there was one language. I mean, there's a universal language and so they shared a language. So there's going to be a lot of these words that are going to be in other languages too. And like languages today, languages evolve in meaning and so sometimes there's an ambiguity on what the, the name would have meant, say, in Genesis chapter 4. Um, so Cain, that's a really disputed one. Abel is Hevel, and it means breath or vanity. Notice right here it says breath, but it, it can also mean vanity. Appointed. 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 Um, That's what his, main, his name means, appointed, because she said, God hath appointed me another seed in place of, of Abel. Sure. It, it appears that way, for sure. Okay. Um, and it's almost as if he's dedicated to the Lord from birth um, because the word shate is taken from the root which means to place or to put. So it's in other words, she viewed it when, they, when he was named as if the Lord had placed him in Abel's place. And, I, and they probably spent extra time developing that because I meant Undoubtedly, they would have learned from what had just taken place. You know, the fall happens. You have kids. One kills the other. So, I mean, there's some learning that's going on in the process of all this. So, I, I figure they probably spent a little more time, you know, preserving him as a righteous seed. And, and we don't know. I mean, there, there's a lot of things we don't know. Did God talk to them about the need to preserve a pure human lineage that would ultimately bring universal salvation that would be retroactive for all of humanity in Christ. I mean, we don't have a lot of those details, but I would have to think if God was that intimate with His creation and continued to walk with them, I mean, I, think, I, 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 mean, I personally think He would have told them some of those things, those who He could trust with that knowledge. I, I believe there's, it very possibly could have happened as early as that time. Um, 
definitely during the time there, shortly thereafter, if not. It doesn't tell us exactly, uh, even in the book of Enoch, the exact timeline of when these divine beings come and start procreating with human beings. We know that it was going on for some time before the flood um, and really heightened before the flood. I mean, that's what essentially brought the destruction because they had corrupted man so much and, and even animals, um, mutations and things. We'll read it in the book of Enoch, but it got so bad before the flood, that's why the flood came. But yet the flood didn't solve the, that problem from happening again. As we'll see, it happened after the flood. It talks about it happening after the flood as well. And, that's, and that right there answers the question of why God allowed holy war. And we're going to talk about this in a sermon series coming up uh, that I'm going to do on love. And just to give you a little tidbit, um, a lot of people ask me, how can God be a God of love if he was a God who called the Israelites to do mass exterminations of people groups whenever they took the land of Canaan? And, and the short answer to that is, um, these people groups living in the land of Canaan, Canaan the one who was cursed by, by Noah, right? The descent of, of Ham or Ham, um, were very into sexual immorality and they were procreating with these divine sons of God and therefore to annihilate the possibility for a corrupted seed God sent them in to kill everyone because if he allowed that to continue you could have had a corruption of the seed amongst the children of Israel which would have stopped the plan of God because God got very specific with this plan. It's going to come through Abraham and his descendants. It's going to come through the lineage of Judah, through the lineage of King David. And therefore, you had the enemy positioned, and we'll, and we'll get to this, why the enemy is surrounding the promised land of all places. Well, he knew that's where the Garden of Eden was. He knew that he was going to take his people back there. He knows uh, where we're going to end up in the New Jerusalem. It's not going to be in Washington, D.C., it's going to be in Jerusalem, right? That's where God's name is. And the enemy knew that, so he surrounded the land with giants. And God said, if you want war, you got war. And he basically calls them to exterminate these people groups because they had intermingled with these other deities, these divine beings. And God had them uh, annihilated. That's one thing that David accomplished is that he killed the last of the giants. A man after God's own heart. He was a giant killer. He killed Goliath and he killed the remaining giants that were left uh, of the Philistines. So, we're getting ahead, but it'll get your wheels turning and prepared for it, so hopefully you read ahead. Peggy? Um, with the neophyte, you know, in the, it's so, just as in the days of Noah, so shall it be. In the the Nephilim? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, will they have to be here too? Not necessarily. There's no, there's no point. The whole purpose behind having giants and intermingling was to make mankind corrupt so that God would judge us, which he did. And also to use the, these giant clans to destroy who would be the children of Israel coming into the land to inherit the promised land to establish themselves so that the Messiah could come from them. He's came. It's done. There's no purpose. I mean, the seed, is, the seed has come. The plan has been fulfilled. And he's coming back. And they know they can't stop it. They couldn't stop him the first time. They sure ain't going to stop him the second time. So the NBA is not the NFL? <laughs> Some people have asked that. Um, I, do, I do believe there is an element of the witchcraft that they introduced that is happening, like the cloning, stem cell research. That's, that's taking it too far. 
That's, that's playing God. And I believe that is, uh, that is the modern-day parallel to what they were doing because we'll see in the book of Genesis some of the things that the, these sons of God introduced to humanity to corrupt us that are heightened today in these last days, unprecedented. And I think we see a lot of that in the, the field of medical science where they are, they are doing things, you know, messing with DNA, taking strands from 40 individuals to create a superhuman. They're going to do it in our lifetime. Taking the best traits uh, for hair and for skin and for, you know, and they're creating their own, I believe that is parallel to what the Nephilim were doing, genetic manipulation. Um, it's going on with foods. It's going on with all kinds of things. But Larry's not a Nephilim, if that's what you're wanting to know. <laughs> you're safe. I believe that's a result of the curse on the earth that has changed the DNA over time. The, I mean, DNA evolves, you know, based on con conditions because we are an adaptive species. We are uh, adapting to environment and things like that. So I believe that's connected to, uh, to the flood, I mean, to the curse on the earth more so than anything. I just we don't see any hint in scripture of Nephilim or sons of God coming and intermingling with humans after David at all. And that was a thousand years before Christ. And part of that is is the greatest uh, sentence of judgment was upon the watchers, the sons of God who procreated with human beings. Peter talks about it. Jude talks about it. Talks about that that they were they were bound in the lowest hell, Tartarus in in Greek, waiting for the day of judgment. So any of the angels or these divine beings, sons of God, who intermingled with human beings, were confined into the lowest hell, waiting for the ultimate judgment or the final judgment. So, I mean, think about it. Satan's not even bound. He's rebellious, but he's not bound. So they are violating the ultimate law of God, which is the intermingling of species. Basically, they were playing creator. And that's why I say some of this stuff that's going on in the field of medical science is playing creator. It's, it's, it's doing things that, <laughs> you know, I don't think we should be messing with. Yeah, we're going to read portions of Enoch. We're at least, I would like to read chapter 6 through 16 in the book of Enoch um, because that really deals with what the watchers introduced. And I, I believe you're going to be quite surprised to see what they introduced to humanity and how actively uh, it is used and promoted today, even within the church. So... I think there'll probably be some conviction. <laughs> so we should bring our books of to class. Sure. I would read ahead. Yeah, we have copies of the book of Enoch, physical copies, if you want to get one. I think they're like 10 bucks, 10, 15 bucks, something like that. Uh, get it, read it, at least read chapter 6 through 16 um, before we meet again, and we'll go over it again. And we can uh, talk about the content in it and ask questions related to it. But, guys, it's a supernatural Bible. And this is one thing that has been stripped in the, in the postmodern uh, pulpits is how supernatural our Bible is and was. And uh, these are things that we need to talk about. It's a reality um, because there are a lot of m modern commentators who want to 
explain a lot of these things away and strip it of its supernatural uh, context and worldview that would have been known to the people it was written to. So, let the Bible be the Bible. Let the text be the text. Don't cheat. I mean, I've never seen um, an angel, you know, myself that I know of. You know, there's a lot of things I haven't seen, but if I believe Jesus became a human being and died for my sins, then I've got to believe it all. Amen. Because if it's not all true, we're in trouble. I mean, it's either all true or none of it's true. I'm going to choose to believe it's all true. And if I believe it's all true, then I'm going to let the text be the text, even when it makes me uncomfortable. Doug, you got a question? No, I just was gleaning from the, the, the uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, well, the generation uh, of all the, the ten people there, and uh, I can tell you one thing after looking at it, the earlier you have the kids, the quicker you're going to die. Except for Enoch, and I guess he had a so bad. He just got to do to take him on out of here. And the two that had them later on in life live longer. So that's why I'm. That's why I'm waiting. That's why I'm waiting. Now, yeah. I figure if I don't have any, I might just live forever. <laughs> Ain't that right, Gary? What do you mean, why was he so young? I mean, I think, it's, I think it's very ironic that he was 365 because that is a solar completion. Actually, 365.25. We'll, we'll get to some of the content in the book of Enoch, and if you read it. Um, well, in the, in the book of Jasher, it talks about Enoch uh, and how that he basically just kept going to spend time with God, if I remember right. And he'd go out for a little while and come back, and the next time he'd go out and stay longer, the next time he'd go out and he'd just stay longer, finally God said, you just want to beat me off, I don't know what to say. Basically, Enoch got to the place where this world was in his home. And God said, fine enough. Come on. It's been years they lived back there. Why, why did they start we'll learn that. We actually talked about that in Hebrew Foundation. Um, but we will learn when that decreased. And it's hidden in one of the names that we'll read in one of the genealogies of all places, Yuktan. Um, and it's in response to the Tower of Babel. I don't, I don't think you aged as fast back then. <laughs> Any other questions? You're corrupting my recording, Doug. <laughs> yeah, you're making us work harder. I believe that would have had a lot to do with it. I believe the earth has continued. I mean, as we fight the curse, we fight the curse with things that hurt us in return, you know? Anyone else? We're going to 
going to set a record tonight, man. Y'all done? All right.